All right, if you'll start a little Bible study with you tonight, if you have your Bibles. I hope you have. Hope you got your Bible. Turn with me to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Nehemiah, chapter number two. And verse number 17. Nehemiah 2 17. Then said I unto them, You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we may be no more a reproach. Amen. Father, bless this word now. Y'all can be seated. There are three names that go together. The name Nehemiah, the name Zerubbabel, and the name Ezra. If you find one, you find the other two. They're all three connected with each other. One's connected with building the wall, to rebuild the wall in Jerusalem. The other's connected with building the temple, to rebuild the temple. And then the other one is connected with restoring the priesthood. And it's so necessary to have the priesthood. And they're interconnected. And a lot of things have to do with what they're doing. For example, when Israel came back from captivity, which they had been carried off into, the two southern tribes of Benjamin and Judah were carried off into Babylon, Babylonian captivity by Nebuchadnezzar. The ten northern tribes were carried off into Assyrian captivity, and they were gone uh, into Assyrian captivity for longer than the two southern tribes. 722 B.C., the northern tribes carried off. 586 B.C., the two southern tribes. The tribes that went to Babylon created what's called the Babylonian Talmud. The Babylonian Talmud is, a, uh, is, a, is it's second only to the Bible, according to Jewish authority and to the rabb rabbinical Judaism. Kairite Judaism does not recognize the Talmud, but rabbinic Judaism does. What is rabbinic Judaism? Rabbinic Judaism showed up when the temple was destroyed and there was no sacrifice nor priesthood. There is no priesthood right now among the Jews, but keep listening tonight because this is important. The Jerusalem Talmud is the, is the other part of the Talmud which was created in the land of Israel. So many, 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 many Jews were carried off into Babylon. And then the Lord began to bring them back from Babylon. They were, they were what's called Aliyah, uh, Aliyah rather. They were brought back from Babylon, from Babylonian captivity. But many of them decided to stay in Babylon and they were, they were prospering. They were making money. They were, uh, you know, apparently they had enjoyed uh, the place that they were located. And if you look at modern day Babylon, you have to look at Iraq. Modern day Babylon is Iraq. And if you look at the number of Jews that are there, it's hard to get an exact figure, but I uh, did a little research with France 24, which is a news outlet, and they say there's only four Jews left all the land of, uh, of Babylon, only four. Now, I don't know if that figure is correct. I don't know if it fluctuates, but that's not many either way you look at it. So why is that important? If they had come back to the land, where God told them to come back to, back to their temple, back to their tabernacle, back to their priesthood, back to the land that God promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, things would have gone differently with them. But this is what we want to look at tonight. We want to look, first of all, at Nehemiah. Chapter number 2, verse 17, he heard the walls were broken down, so he comes back. It burdens him because he loves his land. Oh, Jerusalem, if I forget thee, may my right hand lose its cunning, was the prayer of the Jew. I love Israel, they said. And Daniel, three times a day, would turn his face toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, while he was in Babylon, he would turn his face toward Jerusalem and pray to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so they would not forget Jerusalem. That is their home. And so we read it here in Nehemiah chapter number 2. It bothered him. And so when he came back, they had problems. They had opposition. Look at chapter number 4 of the book of Nehemiah. Chapter number 4 and verse 1. It came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. You see, any time you do something for God, you're going to have enemies. They're going to come against you. Now, regardless of their motive, they're going to come against you. 
And look at verse 2. And he spake before his brethren and the army of the Samaritans or Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? The problem is not the Jews. The problem is the God of the Jews. You don't have to deal with the Jews. Forget that. That's not our problem tonight. Problem's not the Christians. When they start dealing with us, it's not me they're going to deal with. They can wipe me aside quickly. It's the God that I serve tonight. Amen. They'll never wipe him aside. But the Bible says, what do these feeble Jews, will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite, where'd the Ammonites come from? Moab, Moab and Ammon, Ammon. You know where they came from? The Ammonite was by him and said, even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. What a thing. I mean, you talk about mockery and ridicule. You go ahead and build your wall, but if a fox climbs up it, it'll, 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 it'll crumble. It won't be able to stand. But in chapter number two of the book of Nehemiah, it locates these people and tells you who they really are. Nehemiah chapter number two and verse number 20. The scripture said, And then answered I them and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore we his servants will arise and build. Now watch this. But ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. You're not part of anything here. You, have no, you, don't have a, you don't have an iron in the fire. You don't have a dog in the fight. You're nothing. You're, 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 pilot. you're outside. You don't belong to this. Therefore, whatever you may intend to do and however you may t cause us to try to compromise, it doesn't come from your heart. It comes from a wrong motive entirely. Sure, you have nothing here. So now this is how we deal with the building of the wall. Now look at the book of Ezra, chapter number 1, in verse 1. Ezra immediately follows Nehemiah. Ezra, chapter 1. It precedes Nehemiah, not follows. Ezra, chapter number 1, <coughs> and verse 1. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the Persians, the Iranians of today, the king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia. They were going to let them go back. They can go back now. And Zerubbabel wanted to rebuild the temple itself. So he wanted to do what God had laid upon his heart. And look at chapter number 4 of the book of Ezra. Look at chapter 4 of Ezra and verse number 2. Then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said to them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do. And we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assur, which brought us up hither. But Zerubbabel and Joshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers said unto them, You have nothing to do with us to build an house unto our God. So therefore, it gets very important. No, it's a, how, how so? He said, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It's not my job to build his church. Peter, feed my sheep. That's what he said to them three times. That's my job. It's the work of the Holy Spirit of God to build his church. Don't ever be confused with buildings. Buildings have nothing to do with the church of God. This just happens to be where we are tonight. Uh, else we would be outside in the rain coming down, which wouldn't, would, we find the rain in the book of Ezra really didn't change anything. Fact is, it might have worked to the good. No, the church is what he's building. And let me tell you something. You can come to church, you can claim to be one of us, you can claim to be a Christian, but the acid test will be, is the Holy Spirit living inside you? We have this confidence. We have this interconnection. We have this fellowship of the Spirit. And you can't mock it. I mean, you can't fake it. You can't make fun of it. There, you either have the Holy Spirit or you don't have the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Holy, Holy Ghost, you're none of His. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And the Bible says plainly, if you have not the Spirit of Christ, you're none of His. The Holy Spirit. So they told him right there, they rebuked him and said, no, you're not going to be part of this. Now look at the book of Zechariah, chapter number 4 and verse number 6. This tells you how that they're going to rebuild. They're going to come back now, they're going to rebuild. They're going to rebuild the wall and they're going to rebuild the temple. Zechariah, chapter number 4 and verse number 2. 
And the Bible says, And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes of the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof, and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, another upon the left side. So I answered, and spake to the angel, talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? He answered, the angel that talked with me answered and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, Not, no, my Lord. Then he said, and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. You're going to rebuild this temple, and it's making a difference what opposition you have. It's going to be done by the Spirit of the living God. And that's how the work of God is done today, by the Spirit, by the Holy Ghost. This business of having somebody pray a sinner's prayer, and they're okay, you tell them they're okay, and the Holy Ghost is not convicting them is a waste of your time and confusion to them. Amen. Because once you've ever been born again, you feel sorry for these people that have been through this kind of stuff because they don't have the real thing. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. So in chapter number four of the book of Zechariah and verse number nine, here's what it says. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. See this? His hands shall also finish it, and thou shalt know the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. So it's clear in the Bible that Zerubbabel was the builder of the temple of God. Now, we've got two temples we're going to be dealing with tonight, and I'll get to them in just a moment. But keep in mind, we've come to this point. Zerubbabel rebuilt the temple of God, and it's called the second temple. The first temple, of course, was the temple of Solomon. The second temple is the temple of Zerubbabel, which was enlarged and enhanced by Herod the Great. Okay? That's what he did when he showed up. So Zerubbabel builds the temple of God. He laid the foundation. But don't you look at Ezra chapter number 3, just a little point about this. Ezra chapter number 3 and verse number 2. Ezra 3 and verse 2, as it relates to this temple that he built. This is interesting. Ezra chapter number 3, and let's start reading with verse number 1. Ezra 3, 1. Now, have you noticed already that at Ezra and Nehemiah and Malachi and Zechariah and Haggai, they're all connected. They're all connected because they're dealing with the return of Israel from captivity and the prophets that are dealing with what's going on. The prophets are prophesying. These are prophets. Haggai is a prophet. Zechariah is a prophet. These are prophets of the Lord. And they're speaking forth as God speaks. Now, look at chapter number 3 of Ezra in verse 1. When the seventh month was come, the children of Israel were in the cities. The people gathered themselves together as one man to Yerushalayim. Then stood up Yeshua, Jeshua, the son of Jozadak, and his brethren, the priest, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, and builded the altar of God, of the God of Israel, to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. Now watch this. And they set the altar upon his bases, for fear was upon them because of the people of those countries, and they offered burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord, even burnt offerings morning and evening. So what's important about that? They did that before the, tabard, the temple was ever built, before it was ever rebuilt. They were offering sacrifices. Why? Because the altar, the place of sacrifice, is far more important than the building that surrounds it. Here's what one man said, and he put it well. There cannot be a temple without an altar, but there may be an altar without a temple. God meets us at the place of sacrifice. So where does it be? Where does he meet us? At Calvary. Have you been to Calvary? Well, preacher, I can't go to Calvary. That was 2,000 years ago. Oh, yes, you can. Yeah. The apostle said, I came preaching nothing but Christ and him crucified. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. The cross of Christ is a reality tonight. It is a reality and it is the point of sacrifice. Now, you watch the crowd that won't preach the cross. Get away from them. Let them feel the vacuum as you pass out of that place. Get out of there because that's not the church of the living God. No. 
if they won't preach the cross. And if they won't preach the cross, they won't preach the blood. Because they go hand in hand. Amen. Isn't that a remarkable thing, though? These Old Testament Jews, before they built the temple back, first thing they did, and this is the ancient base of the original altar, right. on the base where it had stood before. Yeah. They come and they build, and they come and they offer a sacrifice unto God. Yeah. These are spiritual people. Yeah. These are people that knew what it took yeah. to get a hold of God. They knew what it was about. Amen. Build a big building and impress people or get on your knees to that sacrifice and my friend get a hold of God. Yeah. You have a choice to make. It's all we all make that choice. The Bible says in the book of Ezra, chapter number four, and verse number twenty four, they caused the work to cease. So they ridiculed them and now they're working against them and they had to fight. They had, to, they had to have a weapon in one hand and a tool in the other hand. It took everything under the sun to come back. And this is the way God does things. It wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. The Bible said through much tribulation, we're going to be in tribulation. No question about that. To fight the good fight of faith, war against the enemy. And I'll tell you what, in some ways, maybe folks, in the last month or so, I, I believe a lot of people have been getting an education about war. Amen. Huh. Amen. Really? I mean, good night. And uh, I mean, these people over here are dying at the hands of a monster. And so we see you have seen what war is about. So we have something that happens in Ezra chapter number 7. Ezra chapter 7. Remember now we're restoring the wall, the temple, and now we're going to restore the priesthood. Ezra chapter number 7 and verse number 10. Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. Now who is this man? This man is a learned man. He's a sage. He's a teacher. He's one that God has called aside, that has studied the Word of God, and he's able to teach others also. And so, therefore, Ezra is to be highly respected, yes. highly respected. His job's not easy. What he has to do, as a matter of fact, is a tough thing. Look at chapter number 9 of the book of Ezra. Ezra chapter number 9 and verse number 3. He finds out the spiritual condition of Israel, and it's worse than he ever thought it could be. Look what it says in verse 3. When he heard this thing, this thing goes back to verse 1. I rent my garment and my mantle and plucked off the hair of my head into my beard and sat down astonished. <laughs> astonished at how back slidden Israel had become. A lot of it directly related to their time in Babylon. They had, they had been, they had been infected with the pagan, with the heathen, with their gods. It even says here in the book of Ezra that they had not only married foreign women, but they had taken their gods in. They had begun to worship their gods. Now, you know, folks, that's one of the saddest things in the world. I feel sorry for a pagan that doesn't know anything and he's worshiping a stump. But when you've got the word of God and you've got the light like you have and you turn from this and go to the stump, you're in bad shape. You really are. You're in bad shape. When you have the revealed scripture in your hands, you've got the word of God, the light of the Holy Spirit, and you throw that down and go out here to this modern witchcraft culture in America, and that's what it is. It's witchcraft culture. That's what is that? That's universal. That's everybody the same. Come on in. Join up with us. We all believe in the same God. We just get there in different ways. No, you don't. He said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. There's only one way, folks. Only one way. Peter said, there's only one name given under heaven whereby we must. All right. So we have <coughs> a terrible situation. He's astonished. But he teaches, preaches to the people, verse number one, Ezra chapter number 10. When Ezra had prayed and when he confessed, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, there assembled unto him out of Israel every, a very great congregation of men, women, children, for the people wept very sore. That's good. They heard the truth and it got their heart. And they knew their, they knew their, they knew their heritage. They knew what they were and where they came from. They're not Babylonians. They're Jews to whom the oracles of God had been given. Yeah. They were the keepers of the light, the keepers of the truth, folks. Yeah. There's no pagan anywhere in that, on the face of this earth that's going to trump the truth of the word of God. 
There's no greater revelation out here in darkness than there is in your Bible. This book is God's holy word. And so they repented. And you know in chapter number 3 they had to put away their wives. There's a lot of controversy about what's going on here. They had to put away the pagan wives that they had married. But some say, and it's very possible, it was over a two-month period of time that they gave some of those pagan wives an opportunity to convert to Judaism. Right. Ruth did. Yes. <laughs> Rahab did. Yes, did. So, but I can't, I can't prove it one way or another. But I know God. I know He's a gracious, merciful, long-suffering God, isn't He? Yes. Let me tell you how gracious and merciful and long-suffering He is. There's not a soul in this house tonight that'd be here if it wasn't for that. <laughs> yes. Every one of us. I know that. He, uh, uh, he was more gracious to me than anybody. There's <laughs> yes, a lot of people to argue about that. But I'll tell you where he found me. He found me in a pit. Yep. He's been good to me. Yes. So there's a restoration that takes place. Now they have a wall. Now they have a temple. And now they're being cleansed for the priesthood. Now look at the book of Zechariah, chapter number 3. Now the priest has to be cleansed. Zechariah chapter number 3, and now we get into something very, very interesting. Zechariah chapter number 3 and verse 1. Now remember, Zechariah is contemporary with, with, with Nehemiah and with Ezra and Zerubbabel because Zerubbabel is even mentioned in Zechariah. Watch this. Chapter number 3 of Zechariah, verse 1. He showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Now this is the spiritual confrontation over the future of Israel. What's going to happen to these Jews that have come out of, of, of captivity? It's good to have a building. It's good to have all these things. But here is the acid test. Will God receive this priest because he represents the people? When the high priest went into the Holy of Holies on the seventh month, the tenth day of the month, he represented every single Jew in Israel, yes. that one man. This is, and he's a type of the Lord Jesus because the Lord Jesus comes into the presence of God representing every last human being on the face of this earth. Right. Why? Because there's no salvation in any other. Right. Okay? So here he is. He's standing in front of God. To, 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 be, to be received or rejected. And look at what happens here in verse number 2. And the Lord said to Satan, Satan was standing at his right hand to resist him. Uh, Satan means adversary. Satan is a Hebrew word. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? In plain words, they're here because of a miraculous hand of God. I plucked them up and brought them here, and you're resisting them. Now look at verse 3. Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. And on it goes, talking about how he has changed him and he's no longer filthy, that he's clean. And when God sees him clean, he sees the rest of them clean because they are hid in him. If the Lord Jesus Christ is accepted into heaven by his own righteousness and I am hidden in Christ, my life is hid with Christ in God, then he accepts me. He doesn't accept me for me. He accepts me in being in Christ. And in, in order for God to reject me, he would have to reject his son because I believe on him. And I've received him, and I'm in him tonight. Now look at this thing. This Jehovah, verse number one, Lord, capital L O R D, Yod Hey Val Hey, it's called the Tetragrammaton. It is the ineffable name of God, cannot be spoken. When they come to this, find it in the text. If you had a Hebrew, if you had Hebrew, you'd see the four Hebrew consonants. You'd see them. And when you got to that, nobody'd have to tell you, you'd say, I deny. Because of the respect and love, uh, the, how you cherished this name that is above every name. Yes. So what we have here now is God Almighty interjecting himself into this issue between Satan 
and God over the righteousness and acceptability of Israel. So what does he do? Well, he accepts them. And now what's happening here becomes a type of something that's going to happen in the future. The Bible says they're going to look upon him whom they have pierced. Yeah. And they're going to mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. Right. His coming again, my dear friend. In Revelation chapter 19, upon a white horse, he comes as the king of kings and lord of lords. And he's coming back with his people. So look carefully now. In chapter number 3 and verse 9, Zechariah 3, 9. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. Look at verse 8. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, Thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. That can refer to only one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we've got the Lord Jesus Christ and we've got Joshua the, the priest both in the same context. One of them has to do with what's happening then. The other one is looking into the future. Now look at this thing. In chapter number 6 and verse number 12. Zechariah chapter 6 and verse 12. And speak of them saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch. There's no other Bible in the Old Testament that has branch in it twice, except Zechariah. Two times. Now look at this. He shall grow up out of his place, and he shall do what? Build. He'll build the temple of the Lord. Who? The branch. Who's that? Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is prophecy, and this is where we are now, and we need to look carefully at it. Go back to the book of Daniel with me, chapter number 9, Daniel 9. Daniel chapter number 9 and verse number 27. And this is how you compare Scripture with Scripture to learn a great truth. Daniel 9, 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Who's the he? He's the man of sin. He's the Antichrist. Now watch this. In the midst of the week... He shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the de desolate. What are you talking about here? We're talking about a temple. We're talking about a tribulation temple. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. And verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. That day what day? The day of Christ, verse 2. Except there come a falling away first, now watch this, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. How does he reveal? Well, he signs a covenant with Israel. What kind of covenant? Covenant of peace. Now look at this. I want you to start thinking with me tonight. Are you accepting what the Bible says about a tribulation temple? And that the man of sin enters into the tribulation temple. Well then how could that happen if you're going to have an atomic war, a nuclear war that destroys everything on the face of the earth? Won't work, will it? But you may very well have tactical nuclear weapons used. That may happen, absolutely. Along with, along with gas and anything else that Putin's liable to pull up uh, and unleash on mankind. And on the other hand, when something like that happens, it puts the idea of peace in a different perspective entirely. If you start using nuclear weapons in a tactical situation, in other words, a division against a division and so forth, the world would begin to scream for peace, right? I mean, look what's happening over there right now in the Ukraine. 
And it's already got the world worked up. And God help and God bless those people. But what we're talking about is 10 times, 100 times worse than that. They'll scream for peace. Well, who's the peacemaker? The Bible says in the book of Daniel that by peace, by peace, he shall enter in. Here we go. By peace, agreement with Israel, they can build their temple. And right now, they've been working at this for a long time. Gershom Solomon and others, the temple faithful, have been gathering together the elements of the temple, looking for a red heifer, everything they need to build a temple on the temple mount. And they're going to do it. Because according to the scripture, here's what he says. Verse number 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Like I said to you a moment ago, what's involved with him being revealed? I don't know. I can't say it. But if he's the one who makes a peace agreement with Israel, if he's the man that does it, you're looking at the Antichrist. Now look at verse number 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is God is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now that's bad stuff. And I'm going to tell you something. Even the most apostate Jew on this earth would never accept that. They would never accept a man sitting down in the temple claiming to be God. And so according to the scriptures in Revelation 12, they flee. They flee off into the wilderness. He wants people to worship him. Revelation chapter number 13 says, and they worshiped the beast. They worshiped him. He wants worship. Now this is remarkable. Showing himself that he is God. He wants, he, he, he causes the sacrifice and oblation to cease in the midst of the tribulation. Tribulation is seven years long. Three and a half years in, we have one who sits down in the temple of God. So now here, when you see them start building, you better get ready because that's a sure sign of the soon coming of the Lord. Yes. Building what? Building the temple. Yes. In the book of Revelation, it talks about in chapter number 11, measuring the temple. All right? That's the tribulation temple. So what happens to it? It gets destroyed. That's what happens to it. Why? Why? Because of what it says over here in chapter number 6 of the book of Zechariah. Verse 12. Zechariah 6, 12. And speaketh him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch. He shall grow up out of his place, and he'll do what? He'll build the temple of the Lord, the millennial temple. Now, you look at the book of Ezekiel chapter 43, Ezekiel chapter number 42, verses 15 through 20, and the dimensions of the temple, if this is correct, is a square mile, a mile from one, in other words, a mile, which is much bigger than what's over there now. Why so big? Because the Lord Jesus Christ is going to sit down in that temple that he builds in Jerusalem. And all the nations of the earth will be reminded once again that the Jew first, and also the Greek, that they are the keepers of the oracles of the law. And they'll be the ones who are allotted portions in that land. All the tribes of Israel will be allotted a certain portion. And here he sits in Jerusalem It'll be the most beautiful thing on this earth. And, it'll, and it's called the temple that he builds. He, the branch. So there's two temples coming. There's the temple in Jerusalem that is built by the Jews. There are certain Jews over there, quite a few as a matter of fact, who believe that the Messiah is not going to come until they build the temple. Well, that makes sense to them, right? Yeah. For he'll enter into the temple. All right. And so they're going to build the temple. They're going to bring the Messiah. Well, the problem is that he's already been here and he's coming back. 
And building the temple is not going to bring him back. No. Building the temple is going to give a place for the Antichrist to go in and declare he's God. Now, we live in a generation, I read a thing the other day, said there are 64 different uh, genders. <laughs> Think on that a while. <laughs> 64. Now, of course, we have what's called fluid gender, you know. Has nothing to do with your biological body. It's all up here, okay? And it has evolved to 64. Who knows? It may be 128 next year. I haven't looked up the 64. Has anybody looked up the 64? Okay. Here's what they're doing. They probably don't know it, but here's what they're doing. They're trying to destroy the image of God in man. When the Lord Jesus came 2,000 years ago, made a big deal about this. He was the very image of God. Being the image of God, he restored to fallen man that image that Adam had lost. Yeah. Right now, tonight, you are a mystery. What do you mean a mystery? You have a body that's of the earth. It just goes back to the ground from whence it came. It's called the earth. The, you have this treasure in earthen vessels. It's an earthen vessel of the earth, okay? That's all it is. So, you know, it served me now pretty good for 75 years. It's wearing out. <laughs> And I can see all kinds of problems developing with it. But you see what's inside that is the treasure. You are a spirit being. That's a mystery in itself. Because God's a spirit and nobody knows the essence of a spirit. Nobody. Nobody. One man put it this way. He said, when you get into the essence of God or into the presence of God, there is neither night nor day. There is neither past nor future. It is the eternal now. And I thought that's quite a thing to say it like that, the eternal now. Forever and ever and ever and ever throughout eternity, 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 he changes not. He needs nothing. He exists because he exists. He doesn't need anything to exist. He's God. But it's a mystery, a total mystery. Now here you are sitting in this house tonight. Your spirit being, your spirit being. And you have a soul. Dogs and cats don't have souls, but you've got a soul. When the Lord Jesus died on the cross, his body was laid in the tomb. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And his soul went down to the heart of the earth. Yeah. Thou wilt not leave thine holy one in hell. Hell at the time, of course, was Hades. Had to do with the two sides corresponding Sheol in the Old Testament. Well, leave him there. When we leave this world... We leave this world as spirit beings possessing a soul going into the presence of an eternal being and we will have the very life of God. I cannot imagine tonight a worse curse. Now you think about what I'm saying. To exist forever and not have God. I'm not even talking about hell. I'm just talking about existing forever. Nobody knows how long forever is. Forget it. You can't, you, can't, you can't process it. And yet people throw that word around like it means nothing. Right. You've been in hell a trillion years and you've got a trillion more. No, you've got forever more. Can you imagine that? You can't imagine that. That's beyond your wildest imagination. That's something you have to leave with God. God's the only one that can explain something like that. But our life... Our life will be the life of God. Yeah. God will give us his life. Why? Because he has been forever. Right. He has yeah. been forever. It doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know when he appears, when he comes, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Amen. And Paul said, Amen. we no longer know him after the flesh. No. But we'll see him as he is. Aren't you glad for that? Yeah. Aren't you glad that God gives you his life? Yeah. He's yeah. given you. See, how do you know that, preacher? Because you've got the earnest of the Spirit tonight. That's right. If you're born again, you've got the Holy Ghost. The Holy God bless these poor people out here laying hands on people to get them to receive the Holy Spirit and think they're saved. I know they mean well, but that's as ignorant as it can be. You're born by the Spirit of God. You're sealed by the Spirit of God. You're baptized by the Spirit of God in the body of Christ. All these things, they happen to you. You've got eternal life and nothing can change that. It cannot be taken away from you. 
It cannot, it absolutely cannot be taken away from you. So heaven to me is not streets of gold. No. It's not walls of jasper. It's not gates no. of pearl. These are all beautiful. They're wonderful things yes. and in their place. But I guarantee you, 10 trillion, thousand trillion years from now, a street of pure transparent gold would mean nothing to you. Amen. But Christ Amen. will never change. In his presence is pleasure forevermore. Father, bless your word. The time we have together with my dear brothers and sisters, God bless every one of them. And those, Father, who watched by the internet tonight, who will watch this later, bless them and help them, encourage them, strengthen them. This light affliction, the apostle said, which is but for a moment. And that's what it is, a light affliction, making a difference. And I don't know, he, <laughs> he talked about everything could possibly happen to somebody. It's still just a light affliction worketh for us a greater, eternal word, power, glory. In thy name I pray, amen.